So anyone who works in the in the ANC then got the message that listen, the only reason you've got your salaries and the only reason that okay. the ANC is able to pay you salaries is because of the money that's coming from Amaposa. So he's been able to capture the entire organization. So I'm here, Donald Brown, and I've got the powerful musician, entrepreneur, social media influencer, Nota Beloyu. And he's just been telling <laughs> me a very interesting story of how, to a certain degree, people with and connected to the Ramaphosa campaign is prosecuting him. Prosecuting might be a strong word, but yeah. really putting pressure oh, on him. Persecuting. Per persecuting. That's the word I'm looking for. Persecuting. Yeah. Oh, oh, can, can you elaborate on that, Nota, please? Yeah. Um, so the latest attempt is to try and debank me, you know, um, to try and make sure that I don't have access to my financial resources um, um, to stop me from being able to move. Um, this started with, um, you know, um, Ati Geleba's um, boyfriend, um, who's a, uh, a known DJ. Um, so she's the head of digital and, um, the last interaction I had was with her in court where she came to support, um, the DJ, um, who clearly had, you know, the backing of the judges, um, to make a defamation claim against me, uh, with costs, um, over my commentary on his involvement in a corruption scandal, uh, with the South African Department of Tourism when they did a cookout at his venue. I mean, um, it was revealed within his own testimony that, you know, he has been questioned um, by the Public Service Commission. Um, Sorry, Nota, he just, also, just quickly, a cookout means? It's like uh, where they invite a chef to a restaurant and then they just cook oh. with celebrities. <laughs> okay. celebrity cook I thought yeah. it was something sinister, but okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, I mean, it is actually quite sinister because the whole entire process didn't even go to tender. Um, you know, on the stand, he admitted that he did not um, um, receive an advert, uh, uh, like he didn't go to tender for it. Um, it wasn't tendered. Um, it was just solicited over a phone call and he rented out his venue, um, flouting um, the PFMA. He also admitted that, you know, they didn't follow the PFMA to the T. So, um, he basically admitted, um, that, you know, it was a corrupt dealing and yet still I was defamed, you know, and I was defamed because I was amongst thousands of people, you know, who commented on this and said, you know, here's another example of ANC corruption. And this happens right in the midst of, um, COVID-19, um, uh, when we're in lockdown. This happens when, you know, a whole lot of um, restaurants and eating um, um, establishments within his own, you know, a native community had been shut down or had seen their businesses, you know, um, uh, whittled to almost nothing. And um, he being an ANC ambassador and also uh, being in a, a almost 10 year relationship with the head of digital um, for the presidency, um, you know, um, basically benefited from his proximity to power. You know, um, he's a politically exposed person. And, um, you know, uh, the tourism minister of the time, Mamaluku Kubai, was just redeployed and hidden away, I think in some human settlements department. And he's been able to continue and now they're trying to ensure that, you know, I'm unable to bank in South Africa. Or I'm unable to do any business in South Africa, you know. Uh, I've been basically financially exempt. But uh, taking that further, it seems like the banks are then obviously involved with the ANC's corruption. Because how otherwise would well, they Well, I mean, the, the, they do that because, um, I mean, they can do it without involving the banks per se, um, what they do is that they garnish you. So they create a lawsuit, you know what I mean? They get a judge to uh, make an, uh, a, a judgment for a ridiculous amount. And then should you not pay it um, forthright, 
immediately. What they do is that they garnish you and um, they freeze your bank accounts until um, they've recovered the entire money. Even if you've been paying in part or anything, they don't accept any payment arrangements or anything of the sort. It's basically like a bully tactic. And that's because the courts are in their favor. The sheriffs are in their favor. So they've got their own judges that they appoint to particular cases. They've got their own sheriffs that actually act and enforce on behalf of those judges as well. And um, if you are in their, you know, their crosshairs, uh, you're basically doomed. And is, is this the high courts? Yeah. The South Houting High Court. Wow. And this is a common, yeah. this is a common uh, principle. This happens anyone who opposes the ANC. This, this happens in... in well, not the ANC. Not the ANC. Just anyone who opposes Ramaphosa. So you can oppose the ANC or anyone who's not shielded by Ramaphosa. That's fine. But as soon as you go for Ramaphosa and his allies, that's when you you get significant um, issues. That's when you you find issues. I mean, a lot of people, you know, have got um, different views about um, Jacob Zuma, you know, his corruption trial, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very strange that Media 24, you know, which is headed up by um, the former CEO of Shanduka, which is um, Ramaphosa's investment arm, Putima Nyele Dabengwa, right? Media 24 has got, you know, unrivaled access to all court rulings, even before they announced or put on, on the Staffley website. You know, they've got information, medical records, and they're able to publish whatever's happening within the courts before it's in the public domain. And that was the case that Zuma brought against... Um, Karen Morn and Billy Downer, you know. Um, but he shouldn't have gone for Karen Morn and Billy Downer. He should have gone for Media 24 as a whole. And the fact that, you know, his medical records were published in the newspaper, I mean, people's medical records are supposed to be private. You know, like that is something that we know. Even like when you go see, see a doctor, there's patient um, doctor confidentiality. And they breached that. And because obviously um, their editors and their bosses were behind them at Media 24, they could make it seem as if, you know, they'd done nothing wrong. They could get other journalists to come outside the courtroom and protest. But that was wrong. Had it been done to someone else, it would have been seen as wrong. But because it was done to Zuma, who people have got, you know, um, differing opinions about, you know, it was um, fair play, I guess. It was, you know, all fair in love and war. And it's war. Um, with these people. I mean, I don't see myself as a Zuma supporter, um, but I don't like seeing the law being um, used to abuse people and being dealt with unfairly. And we're seeing that. I mean, it's it's, it's a continuous uh, thing. Right now, um, the Reserve Bank is, is shielding Ramaphosa. You know, he knows that the parliament will shield him as well because the NC has got a majority there. And the public is doing nothing about it, and the media is doing nothing about it. The media 24, they're not writing exposés about it. Why? Because, you know, Sir Ramaphosa's right-hand woman is the CEO of, of Naspers, you know? Um, so that shields him as well. Um, ETV, they're not going to say anything about it. That's E-Media, which is owned by Johan Rupert, and Johan Rupert has got business interests um, with uh, Ramaphosa as well. So he's not going to um, come for him directly uh, with regards to the Palapala matter, you know. Um, and I mean, it's a bigger scandal than even the the, the Zimbabwean uh, gold mafia that was, you know, revealed by uh, Al Jazeera. But then you have to think to yourself, why was the gold mafia revealed by Al Jazeera and not South African media? You know, why wasn't it ETV checkpoint that did that? Why was it not, you know, SABC News that um, and did that since they've got such a keen interest in affairs in Zimbabwe? Al Jazeera never really reports about what's happening in Zimbabwe. That was the only one and only time that they did. And it had to do with the gold mafia. And then you see um, uh, Sol Ramaphosa endorsing the sham of an election that happened in Zimbabwe over the past week. You know what I mean? And you also know that he's got business interests in the in platinum mining 
um, firms. And it seems like he's got his hand on each and every single one of the businesses that he swore under oath that he would, you know, put in a blind trust, which is supposed to be um, in the hands of Putuman Tlevo and have no involvement in. And he's able to deny that. And the public protector is able to shield him, you know, the new public protector, because she wanted um, to secure a nomination to the job, which needs a 60% majority for her to get. So I wonder if he'll, he'll be able to get that without the DA helping the ANC to secure that, you know. Um, so um, now, you know, the Palapala case um, seems like, you know, it's going to be something that uh, is not able to be used to actually unseat Ramaphosa. The DA claims that, you know, they're trying to take the ANC out of office. And yet the strongest person or the most popular person in the ANC is one that they see as a holy cow, you know, a holy uncle, you know, <laughs> or a boring bull. Yeah, you holy know, buffalo. A multi-million rent. <laughs> well, I, I'd rather call him a, a, a cow because, you know, he trades in those um, for millions of rents, to the tune of millions of rents. So this Palapala saga um, that just keeps on being ignored by uh, the mainstream media um, back home in South Africa, um, should have been his undoing, you know. Um, he's receiving funds, um, foreign funds, they're undeclared. Um, people are being um, assaulted. There's abuse of power. Police are being used, uh, crossing um, uh, national borders, um, you know, out of their jurisdiction. You know, um, other presidents of other neighboring countries are being involved in the cover-up, you know, um, Ganog from Namibia was also involved in the in the cover up, and you're seeing uh, that you know uh, Ramaphosa and Nangagwa, and I mean all the other despots, I guess, on the African continent are one and the same. One and the same. They're able to use um, the state to clamp down on any dissenting voices. And um, we're in a scary dictatorship. Uh, the scariest part about it is that, you know, if you oppose people like him, um, you get killed. You know, um, it's, it's, it's one of the, the main reasons why, you know, I avoid Johannesburg, you know, which is my home, you know. Um, it comes. It comes at a, a very great personal cost for me to have to only speak to my parents over the phone. You know, it comes at a very great cost for me not to be able to, you know, even have um, a relationship with my wife because she fears for her life, and you know, she knows that there's things I know that could potentially get her killed or get me killed. Um, and. You know, um, I've tried to come to terms with it over the past, I guess, nine months or so. Um, and um, I, I was having doubts at first. I was like, you know, should I even speak about this? Should I even speak about the fact that, you know, there's a price on my head, you know, um, that would, if I go home, I need to employ um, security, you know, um, at least where I am now, I don't have to. You know, and if something were to happen to me, at least uh, there would be accountability for whoever did it. You know, whereas at home, you know, even the most prominent people can get shot in the streets outside garages. They don't care whether it's caught on CCTV camera. I don't know if you saw that businessman that was shot outside a garage in the Northwest. No, I did not. Um, just recently. Yeah, but I mean, it happened two weeks ago and, you know, no one's been caught. You look at what's happening in the courts in South Africa, you know, murder cases are going unsolved. And, you know, hitmen are able to brag about their job and take pride in the fact that they are able to take lives with impunity as long as they follow the instruction of those who are politically protected. And that is a real scary uh, state of affairs. I mean, I used to see these things in movies from Colombia and Mexico. Um, but that to be a South African reality is something that, you know, I think we should all be really fearful of and something that we should all be concerned about, you know, um, as, especially um, uh, for black people in South Africa, because 
you know, um, black people die at such a, a, a an alarming rate, right? That when someone is targeted, um, it's not really seen as, you know, something that uh, the public should have an outcry of. You know, yes, it's it's hurtful. They'll mourn for a while, and then they'll forget about it. You know, and um, life will continue as normal. Um, but you know, uh, it's it's not like um, uh, when there's like a farm murder or something. You know, um, because of how vulnerable farmers are, I understand the w- the way in which they respond to you know farm killings because they are vulnerable. The police are very far away um, from you on the farm. You cannot scream for help. No one will hear you. So they need to take extra precaution and they need to be extra loud about it because, you know, they could be targeted. And, um, you know, when someone is making an outcry for something that affects their safety and their well-being, um, we cannot ask them to be reasonable about that, you know, because their life is on the line. Um, so I understand that. Um, so, you know, I, I could not also, uh, um, be reasonable about thinking, oh, well, you know, there is some safety. If I stay within Santin, if I stay within the safe areas, you know, I might be safe. Um, that's not the case. You know, I had an incident where I was buying a chai latte in the middle of the night, you know, cause chai latte helps me sleep. You know, I don't know or hot chocolate sometimes at night helps me sleep, right? I had to call my father from the back of a police van because the police just abducted me at the filling station to send a message. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, back up. Did they, did they say you were outside of your car or did they tell you to in, get in out of the car? In my gown. I was, I was outside. In I was uh, walking to my car. I was in my gown. Uh, and this is SAPS. This is not... Yes. Uh, okay. and I, uh, this is SAPS at the, at the Caltex and Wittkopen. And then I, uh, luckily, they didn't take my phone. So I had my phone while I was in the back of the van. They were taking me to Dalbethia Police Station. And then I called my dad. And then my mother, I could hear in the background, oh, what is it now? You know, and I just told her, yo, please, mom, quiet down. I just told my dad, dad, meet me at the Dalbethia Police Station. They've just taken me. You know, my dad had to plead with him. Like, why are you guys taking my son? What has he done? You know what I mean? Is he not allowed to buy himself hot chocolate? Like, like what's wrong? You, you, you find him in his underwear and his gown. I was in my boxes and my gown. Like, what are you doing? Why are you putting him in a holding cell? The Douglas Dale police station was pitch black at that time. Load shedding. Didn't even have backup power. The backup power was either off or they didn't have enough diesel to run the generators. You know? Um, but the, the constant targeting, you know, having been followed around by whether it be Metro cops, you know, you're not breaking a law, but the Metro cops are harassing you. They're stopping you for no reason. You know, they're, they're, they're really trying to get at you. The people are trying to send a message. And I heard the message and I said, you know what, let me go to somewhere where they can't touch me. And, um, now it's like, okay, I cannot run away forever. I need to fight back. I need to fight back. And, um, I need to get as much assistance as I can get, you know, cause I cannot fight this on my own. Um, it, it's taken a lot of my resources, you know, and those that I have left, um, you know, are being frozen. And now it's forced me into a position where I have to make alternate means. Fortunately for me, you know, I've got skills that, um, can, uh, um, help me, um, earn anywhere in the world. Um, so that's one good thing. Um, so they cannot stop that. Um, but I mean, at what rate does one need to earn to actually fight against, you know, the president? Because it seems like that's where the instructions are coming to clamp down. Well, I mean, it's not seems like it's very obvious. Why, why do you think, I think you said it, that Ramaphosa, it's not about opposing the ANC, it's about opposing Ramaphosa. Why do you think his group or his faction is so much more aggressive? Because of what is at stake. The control of the country is what is at stake, you know? And um, they're trying their best 
to save his image so that in the likelihood that the ANC does not uh, get a favorable majority, um, they might have enough of a majority to still maintain the presidency. And the president has got um, the most power of anyone in South Africa. He's got the appointing power to appoint the head of the judiciary. He's got the appointing power to um, um, appoint the head of prosecution. He's got the appointing power to uh, appoint the head of chapter nine institutions um, as long as they're supported by parliament. So, you know, even if he doesn't have a majority, as long as he's president and he's got significant support in some form of coalition, he still has all the power to hand out enough patronage to keep himself in power and to continue with his, you know, corrupt ways. Also, he's the only person who's got enough of um, a, a hold on the business interests of South Africa, um, the only black person, you know, to ensure that he is able to um, pay for that patronage, you know. I mean, every time you drink Coca-Cola, you're paying for Ramaphosa's presidency. Anytime you order something from McDonald's, you're paying from, for Ramaphosa's presidency. You know, anytime you watch DSTV, you read the city press, you're paying for um, Ramaphosa's protection, you know. Um, so those are the companies um, that he controls. I mean, even the minerals that leave this country, they're traded in, um, by Glencore. And he's got a significant shareholding, the highest black shareholding in, in Glencore. Um, so even with the commodities boom, you know, he's made a lot of money um, for himself. Uh, right now, the political party funding laws, you know, prevent uh, them from receiving a certain amount of funding. But they don't prevent, you know, them doing business and receiving profits and earnings from that business. It's about the donations that they receive. And they don't need um, donations um, as long as, you know, a business is still working well, his personal business, and they don't have to declare the money that they get from um, Palapala Farm or any other business endeavor that he may have. I mean, there was an issue prior to the conference um, that happened uh, last year, the ANC conference, which I was there to attend to actually see the goings on. You know, I spoke to Tabon Beki as well. Um, when I was there very briefly, uh, we had a, a, a brief engagement, you know, um, just to see which side he was on. And um, uh, he was able to to tell me a couple of things that, you know, um, revealed a lot about how Ramaphosa intends to rule the ANC. And um, as soon as the conference was concluded and Ramaphosa had won, all of a sudden they were able to afford to pay salaries. You know, so anyone who works in the in the ANC then got the message that, listen, the only reason you've got your salaries and the only reason that the ANC is able to pay you salaries is because of the money that's coming from Ramaphosa. So he's been able to capture the entire organization. He's been able to buy the entire organization the, from office staff, you know, to suppliers, to even the suppliers that were owed money in the past, um, you know, that had taken the organization to court. All of them have been paid off and are now throwing the party line. That's why you won't see any dis dissenting um, voting in parliament. You know, if you could put Ramaphosa to a, a vote of no confidence right now, um, the speaker won't even entertain it. It will be thrown out before it even gets to voting, you know, um, and there will be no secret ballot that will be allowed. So we're, we're in a dictatorship. And um, there's, you know, there's no way in which um, he can be challenged. I mean, Gwede Mantashe protected himself um, by ensuring that he secures um, Ramaphosa some support that he much needed. So Gwede Mantashe had access to, you know, some of the votes um, that could swing um, the presidency of the ANC in any which way. And, you know, he made a deal with the devil. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And they've scratched each other's backs. Uh, Gwede Mantashe returns as the chairman of the ANC. Uh, Ramaphosa uh, stays as the president. And uh, Paul Mashatile's hands are tied. Unless, you know, Ramaphosa gets a heart attack, falls over and dies. Um, you know, Paul Mashatile stands no chance of ever 
um, ascending to the presidency. And by the time the next um, elective conference of the ANC happens, he'll also be out. That's why you've seen such a coordinated attack on his image um, in Media 24, which again is Ramaphosa Media because it's headed up by CEO of Nascar's Putima Anyele Dabengwe, who's the um, former CEO of Shanduka, Ramaphosa's investment firm. And Chris Baker? Is he involved well, in this? Chris Be- he, he's a businessman. Chris Becker sold 2.4 billion rands uh, worth of shares in Nasper's. He's getting into food. You know, you're in the Cape right now. I'm sure you've tried Babylon store, right? Have you Have you had some groceries? They're actually pretty good. I won't lie. No, I've not. No, you know, I've not. No, I should. You, yeah, you should actually. You you should. They deliver them. You know, I think the delivery is still free. Uh, um, and the food quality is really great. Um, as well. It's better than Woolies, I'll t- tell you that much. Um, so, you know, he's got other interests. He's got other focuses, you know. He's also trying to ensure that the 10 cent investment um, uh, continues to yield positive results, you know, that the markets in China um, have come under significant constraints. Um, a lot of their property um industry you know uh, has also come under significant constraints with low occupancies and them having overbuilt you know and ever grand um i think they're yeah, considering filing for bankruptcy um as well um so that is also um something that is concerning him there's also the whole process naspers you know uh, I don't know. There's some sort of disambiguation of the shareholding that needs to happen over there. Um, they try to basically move um, um, a process onto the Amsterdam Stock Exchange and um, keep uh, NASPERS here and um, bundle up their shareholding. And now they are unbundling again. Or the other way around. I don't know. Actually, it's actually very, very confusing. Um, what is whatever's happening with Naspers and Process? Um, so he's got a lot on his plate, and I don't think that you know he cares too much as long as his business is able to operate. You know, um, he knows that um, um, the the president will do his bidding, so he's protected. He's in the ascendancy. Interesting. You you mentioned that. To a certain degree, you're planning to fight back against Ramaphosa, the this, this silencing from Ramaphosa. What, what does that fight back entail? Are you planning to fight well, this? Yeah, uh, well, um, one bite at a time. So, you know, um, the people that can um, soften his image, those are my targets. Whether it be the entertainers that you know will be his cheerleaders and all the the the, the soft targets, so that you know um, his true image is strong, you know, um, and that's about it. Um, that's all I can do. That's all I can afford. I, ca- I cannot afford to take him on head on because the judges will not be in my favor. You know, um, the constitutional court will not be in my favor because. The Chief Justice, you know, was appointed by Ramaphosa um, against the recommendations of the Judicial Services Commission, you know. So, uh, you know, he's, he, he owns the courts. He owns everything, you know. And um, people are dying. You know, Tina Juma Peterson, you know, licked too much on a teacup and, 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 and died. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, I cannot, you know, um, clearly lives are expendable. And um, I think um, if something were to happen to me, you know, uh, I really struggle to see how our country can actually, you know, recover from losing so many people that actually love the country and want um, to see the country prosper instead of just milking the country for all it's worth so that um, they can enrich themselves and they can see their families prosper. Which is the situation that's happening right now. It's like, it's every man for himself. Everyone's yeah. milking um, the country um, for what it's worth, yeah. Uh, 
I'm posing this question to you because obviously you know a lot of what goes on within the ANC, the the, the backroom yeah. deals. What do you think of the Patriotic Alliance? I mean, there's some are saying this this is a true and legitimate party. There's others saying, oh, this is a creation of the ANC. I think I think there's a person that has implicated them in the state capture commission, uh, Zondo commission, that they were funded by the ANC. What well, what do you think of Gates and McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance? Well, all these parties are funded by people that are trying to keep the ANC in power. So, you know, if you make the allegation that they are funded by the ANC, you're not going to find the evidence thereof. But if you actually look for the evidence of people that have funded the ANC in the past funding these other parties, then, you know, you might see more breadcrumbs leading you to, you know, um, um, Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> you know, um, so... Um, all of these parties are, are basically uh, just about ensuring that people are confused. They don't know who to vote for and they stick to what's familiar because they know that there's a, a bit of cognitive dissonance that comes when people are now um, given the instruction to vote. They, there's, they've got so many options. You know, it's like when you walk into the garage, have you ever just picked Coca-Cola because there were so many other options that you said, you know what, let me just pick Coca-Cola. <laughs> it's the familiar one it's the one that I see in every single ad there's 20 million energy drinks there and you just decide you know what let me just pick Red Bull because the other options are just confusing me and that's exactly what happens with the ANC you know there's so many parties out there and then you know you know what let me just pick the ANC it's the one that I'm familiar with and there's so many people that are going to be doing that you know um, their support might be shrinking but Ramaphosa knows that he's not banking on the ANC's support. He's banking on his own personal cult of image. You know, the cult of personality um, politics has been entrenched in the ANC since uh, the times of Nelson Mandela. You know, Nelson Mandela was bigger than the ANC. Tawam Beki ascended to presidency and became bigger than the ANC as well. And then Jacob Zuma, when he was the president, he was bigger than the ANC as well. Um, and now Ramaphosa is the one who's bigger than the ANC. So people are not voting for the ANC per se. They're voting for whoever's the leader of the ANC. They're voting for Ramaphosa. And as long as Ramaphosa can maintain his image, then, you know, he will get the votes. Because that's whose face people see on the ballot. The only chance you have of reducing uh, the majority of the ANC is to reduce the popularity of Ramaphosa. And unfortunately... Um, Julius is, is no match for Ramaphosa. He's a political novice, and that's the same Ramaphosa that kicked him out of the ANC in the first place. Oh, yeah. Why? Why do you think so many people are not voting? Because uh, they feel um, dejected. There's a there's a cognitive dissonance, especially young people. They see that voting doesn't change anything. You know, it's like, a, 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 it's ritualistic, it's a ceremony, um, but the results are that they're still hungry, you know, um, they are still lacking opportunities, and um, they still don't have a vested interest in the direction of the country. Also, urbanization is also a big problem. Urbanization means that, you know, all these people come to a city um, for job opportunities, and they don't come to be citizens. So as much as there's a whole lot of South Africans that are saying, hey, we've got all these illegal foreigners in the country, but, you know, some of you guys are also economic refugees. You go to Cape Town because it's a nice city to be in, to, to work in, it's got a nice, but you, you don't love Cape Town. You know what I mean? You don't love Cape Town. If a nuclear bomb were to drop on Cape Town and you were lucky enough to survive, you'd move to the next city. Um, you know, so... That's what I've seen. It's uh, I'm a I'm a Joe Burger through and through. My grandmother was born in Johannesburg. I love Johannesburg. You know, uh, my ancestors are buried there. Um, you know, and not many people are three generation Johannesburgers. So I'm seeing what's happening in my city. You know, buildings that are hijacked uh, are burning down. People are dying in the numbers. I think almost a hundred people have died. You know, in Johannesburg as we're recording this. You know, um, the numbers are, are busy adding up and tallying up in a building that burnt down because 
there is no mayor, there is no governance, there is no, you know, there's nothing that's happening there. When I was having um, uh, my fights with the Metro cops and saying they're not doing their jobs, you know, people are looking at me like I'm crazy because they don't care about their city. But I'm like, listen, these guys are supposed to be doing their job and your safety is compromised when they don't do their jobs, when they don't ensure that the bylaws are being followed. The Metro cops are supposed to be going from building to building, making sure that buildings are not hijacked. And they didn't do their jobs. And now there's 100 people dead. And yet when I challenged them to actually do their jobs properly, eight months ago, you know, you just shared it on TikTok and said, look at this lunatic. And then you're going to be mourning when the mass graves are being filled up with those um, 100 or so dead people and next week. You know, it's going to be a national disaster. The president is going to speak about it. He's going to talk about how, how sad he is and condolences to all the families. And they're going to pay them money to compensate them. And then it's going to happen again because their lives are disposable. That's what you need to know is that no one cares about your lives. In fact, there's less burden for the taxpayers to pay for. I'm sure the people in power are very happy that those people died. You know, they're very happy, you know. Um, but the saddest part about it is that those people those corpses are going to be left out in morgues that are overfilled, right? And right now to have a, b- a body put in a morgue and to ensure that it's refrigerated, you actually have to pay top dollar. You have to, have to pay extra, you know, otherwise they put it in, in the big fridge where they pile the bodies on top of one another, wow. you know, and they're only identifiable through the total. This is what's happening in mortuaries. If you actually do a documentary on what's happening in South African mortuaries for worldview, you'll actually see it. Um, wow. So, so where specifically? Is, is there any specific spot? All over or? South Africa. All over, all over South Africa. All over, all the morgues. The morgues, uh, this started happening during COVID when the morgues were overfilled. So they got the big fridges that they keep in the butcheries, you know, the ones where the cold rooms. So they got the cold rooms and they pile the bodies inside the cold rooms. And then the people that have got money to actually book a spot where you're put in the morgue bed, right? They get um, that. And the people that don't have the money for that, they the bodies get piled in in the cold room and then tow tapped. Yeah, you know. Uh, yeah, um, uh, th- so that's this not new to me. Someone has mentioned this to me, but sort of what I'm thinking yeah. is that how do you actually? Because I can think a morgue will simply just deny you access if you're a media person. Um, I mean. I don't think they'll deny you access. I think they need assistance as well. Um, the government is not helping them. The state morgues um, cannot deny you access because public access to information, you know what I mean? Uh, they can maybe delay you getting access, but they cannot deny you access. You, you, you can go to the public morgues, you know, the state morgues. You don't have to go to the private ones. Um, but that's where it's the worst, you know. So you've got a 100 dead bodies in Johannesburg right now. Where are you going to put them? There isn't a morgue capacity to, to, to accommodate 100 people dying in a day. There isn't. You know what I mean? And then you have to identify all of those people through DNA. There's a DNA backlog, so you're not going to be able to identify those people through DNA. Those people, a lot of them are you know, undocumented migrants. So you're going to have a whole lot of people that are buried in the state. You know? So they're going to have to bury them in mass graves. And then hope that their family members, wherever they are in Mozambique, Malawi, Zimbabwe, are going to come and try and claim their bodies. But the bodies would have been already long decomposed and they won't be able to use DNA to identify them because obviously there's not enough um, funds for them to use, you know, a private forensic pathologists to do the DNA test and identify their bodies. And because the state DNA uh, labs um, are, you know, they've got at least an eight month backlog. Um, no one is going to be able to stay here eight months. You know, there's no visa that's going to allow you to stay eight months to identify a body of your deceased relative, unless you've got enough money to pay for your stay. So it is what it is, you know, and that's it. I mean, like, um, that's the state of our, our, our nation, you know, um, currently, you know, lives are disposable, especially the black lives are disposable. And it's not a, a race thing, but, you know, imagine if white South Africans did not care enough about, you know, their own fellow white South Africans 
that they would allow uh, um, white South Africans to perish in, in, in such a fashion. Like no one would have any empathy for them because already, I mean, when someone sees a, a, a white guy begging on the side, side of the road, no one actually feels sorry for them, whether it be black, white or anything. No one like um, the, there was an outrage when um, there's this other um, rapper called Akon. I'm sure you know Akon. Akon is very big. Yeah, so yeah, Akon yeah. said, you know, um, so it said um, like the poor white South Africans have got the worst living conditions of anybody. And people are like, oh, no, how could you say that? And, you know, and I'm like, like, who ever helps? Which organization has ever been started to help poor white South Africans? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, none. They've got the worst living conditions. Because to be a white South African means that you need to pay a premium to live in a secure estate, to have security, to not live in the township when no one is actually going to care for you or empathize with you. So it's more expensive to be white and South African you know, um, and live in South Africa than it is to be black in South African. You can't go to, um, you're, fr- you're from the Western Cape, right? If, let's say, you, you couldn't keep up your rent in the city ball in Cape Town, you can't go and stay at your grandmother's house in Tukuletu. Whereas a black South African from Cape Town, you know, once they fall on hard times, they can go to their grandmother's house in Tukuletu where they don't have to pay rent, you know, things are a lot cheaper there. They can survive, you know, live within their means and build themselves back up. White people do not have that safety net. Um, I look at it like in the form of arts and music, you know, ever since the advent of streaming, you haven't seen one white artist from South Africa that makes music that is able to top the streaming charts. Why? Because the numbers are not there, you know, from a base of 7 million white South Africans, um, how many of those people are, are you going to be able to gather? Even if every single white South African had an Apple Music account, right? Uh, and they were paying uh, 60 bucks a month. The amount of money in that pool wouldn't be enough to support um, um, uh, those talents. So they have to apply their trade in other countries, in Europe, in the Americas, elsewhere. Whereas, you know, black South Africans have got the power of numbers and the popularity. You know what I mean? You could come from a township like Kukulech and become a national superstar tomorrow very easily, you know. And um, there's no one that says, oh, no, um, we need to have quotas (laughs) on our streaming charts, (laughs) you know. Um, Or or on our water. We need to have quotas on our water. I mean, how do you have quotas on our water? Exactly. That's the whole entire point. So these ridiculous suggestions um, that come about because, you know, people are race obsessed instead of people obsessed. They're not thinking about the well-being of human beings. They're thinking about um, creating master races within the country and uh, subjugating others who they feel, you know, have done something to them Um, and not holding those in power accountable. I mean, if you want to hold um, Hendrik Verhut accountable, right? You, you know his entire family lineage. If you want to hold Jeff Malan um, accountable, I mean, okay, you'd have to isolate the rest of the family from his son because, I mean, uh, his, his grandson, because I know that there's one, Jeff Malan's grandson, you know, who's like wanted to even change his surname, you know, at some point in time um, and denounced his whole entire family. Um, those are the people that were in power and those were the elites. But now if you went to paint everybody else that's living in the country with the same brush, you know, you're going to create enemies out of people that you should be in uh, allegiance with to actually, um, develop this country and make it, um, a country that is, you know, for all its people as is uh, part of our constitution and, and, and our bill of rights, you know which is what the, the Freedom Charter that they always, um, you know, uh, fall back on espoused. You know, South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And um, it seems like the elite uh, are ensuring that um, South Africa ends up in their hands and everybody else has to rent space. Now, sir, um, I want to ask you an interesting question. That comes mm-hmm. up, and many. This is nothing to do with Cape Independence. It's just a question mm-hmm. that comes up in the polling when the Cape Independence people do the polling via Victory Research, Gareth and Onselin. And the question they keep on mm-hmm. asking is, 
does South Africa belong equally to all who live in it? And the results that come back, based on this question, Mm -hmm. 88% of white people say yes. So 88% say South Africa belongs to all equally. 80% of colored people say yes. 31, 31 of black people say yes. So the majority of Mm. black people, according to this poll and numerous other other polls, believe that South Africa does not belong to all equally who live in it. What do you think of Mm -hmm. this? Because some say this is an indication, some say, that the majority of black people in South Africa are racist. What do you think of that? Well, I don't think... um um racist is the, the the best way to call them um it's cognitive dissonance they've been brainwashed so if you give people like a free pass at victimhood you know it's like the the feminism um movement right now you know every woman is a victim and therefore you know when you encounter a woman who's in a shopping mall having a meltdown or being rude to people, you know, um, she feels entitled to behave in that way because because she's a woman that makes her a victim. And that's the same thing with making black people victims, you know. Uh, I've spoken very much that, you know, a lot of my family's wealth, you know, was lost because of democracy. You know, we're wealthier in apartheid than we are now, you know. Um... Like, I mean, my family, my dad's business was decimated. I mean, he practically had a monopoly on, 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 on what you call on home improvement in Soweto before he had to compete against, um, the big companies or, you know, um, um, other construction, uh, firms that came from outside of the community. You know, he was building factories. Um, there's a big steel plant, Eriton Steel in, in Deep Loop. You know, or just off Ransko Road, um, in 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 Soweto. It's since democracy, he has not had the opportunity to to be part of any project of 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 that sort. You know, um, all the big projects have gone to the big multinational conglomerates, the same construction cartels that did price fixing to build the World Cup stadiums and paid whatever it is a pittance and a fine 1.7 billion rand out of the hundreds of billions that they were able to make you know the ones that dominate the infrastructure projects and the money that is being made from these infrastructure projects is not filtering down to the small um medium or enterprises that were able to make a living for themselves and grow before um democracy um small business has suffered the most, you know, out of the new jobs that have come um, to South Africa since COVID, you know, 50% are in small business and it's still contributing. But if you look at the rate at which small businesses have grown, you know, that's shrunk. Um, If you look at the the failure rate of small businesses, that has grown as well. So we know that our government is not putting in place policies that are actually going to alleviate the unemployment um, problem. Um, they're just putting in policies that are going to um, exacerbate the black victimhood problem. And that is in all the media. So it comes as no surprise that people who are brainwashed into thinking that their blackness means that they're victims of something um, feel like um, they're victims of their country being stolen. Um, it's not. You know, it's not even their country. They're not willing to work for it. They're not willing to make the sacrifices that they have to make to keep their country in a good condition. And that's why their communities are in the dilapidated states that they're in. Um, so, I mean, even with Cape Independence, it's like, think about it like this. Why is Cape Independence, which has got a lot of white people that are supporting it, the only movement for independence? What happened to the um, KwaZulu-Natal royal family? You know, before 1994, they wanted their own independence. They wanted self-determination. What happened to that? What happened to the Northwest? The Northwest is the province which has got the highest growth rate of unemployment. The highest. 
you know, it's got the least opportunities. It is, you know, the poverty is growing in the Northwest worse than anything else. The Northwest used to have uh, Mabatu, uh, the Mangope administration. Why are they not saying, hey, let's also um, have local government that, you know, gives us some sort of self-determination. That was a thriving place, you know, uh, in the Buputuswana government. That was a thriving place. They had their own media landscape. They had everything. The Lion King was recorded there. You know, they were proud. If you look at, um, um, uh, what is it? Is it the, the Vembe district or uh, in Venda? In Venda, at least the people are, are building up their communities. There's mansions all, all over the rolling hills of Venda in Limpopo. They're investing in that, you know, um, because each December they want to go home. Why? It's because they're a minority group and they know that within the big cities, we are outnumbered. So we can never feel at home within the big cities. So we stay within uh, our our pocket of Limpopo where, you know, we feel like we've got a vested interest. But everybody else, you know, they don't have a vested interest. They just come to the city to work. They don't care whether it's dirty. They don't care whether the streets are, are kept as long as they're earning their salary and as long as their small little um, Baldwin property box is is clean, um, they're fine. They're satisfied with that. You know, people don't go outside, enjoy the outdoors, enjoy, you know, um, the amount of land that is just there, unoccupied, uh, where you can roam freely. You know, they'd rather just stay cooped up in small apartments um, and, um, and I guess, earn a living because that's all their lives have boiled down to. So those people have given up on themselves. So it's no surprise that those people feel as if, you know, they are hard done by or they've been given the short end of the stick. They've just chosen to take the short end of the stick and not look, you know, to change their hands. Super fascinating. Now, um, yeah. I think we're running, we're running over time. <laughs> this this was really interesting yeah. as always. Is, is there anything else you want yeah. to leave our viewers with before we conclude? Yeah, well, I mean, um, great work and congratulations. I've seen uh, the documentaries, I've been watching them, you know, um, keeping us in touch as well, um, you know. And um, yeah, um, if anyone has got any suggestions on how we can, you know, fight these legal battles uh, that keep um, coming as a, a stumbling block, um, please feel free to contact me. You know, uh, I think if you leave my social medias, whatever, at La Vida Nota, everywhere, uh, people can contact me and then we can continue this discussion. And um, yeah, I can't wait um, to see you guys again. Um, in December, uh, I'll be in, in Cape Town, spending a lot of time in Cape Town for uh, my December holidays. Um, so I can't wait to enjoy the summer um, back home. And I miss the food terribly. <laughs> <laughs> the bolton. Yeah. Everything. Everything. You know, like everything is GMO here. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't matter what you get from the grocery store. Whether you go to a restaurant, whether you cook for yourself, all the food is absolutely terrible. You know, it's it, it, it takes the life out of you. There's nothing worse than having a meal and then feeling tired and sleepy because, you know, there's almost no nutrients or no nutrition. So South Africans don't um, have any idea um, how good it is um, to be able to eat decent meals, you know, and at, I guess, a fifth of the cost that you get a meal for up here. Um, so I can't wait um, to be back home soon, you know, see the family and, um, yeah, let's keep up the fight. Um, 2024 is abound. We need to encourage young people to take part. We've seen what has happened in Zimbabwe. You know, um, a lot of young Zimbabweans abandoned the fight for their country mm. and they're reaping the re the rewards of that. You know mm. what I mean? They're the ones who shot themselves in the foot. Absolutely. And, um, and you know, they can say, oh, no, the, uh, the election results did not go our way, but they're not taking to the streets to protest. You know what I mean? They've accepted defeat and we cannot accept defeat. There's too much goodness and too much potential in South Africa for us to give it up, you know, um, to thugs and criminals and, you know, um, and buffaloes. <laughs> we need the entire big five to thrive. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that's such an awesome and great final message. Thank you so much, Nota. And yeah, thank you thank as you. always. No thank problem. you for your time. 
Thanks, Donald.